Hi, I'm Lucy Baker. I'm the Senior Communications Manager here at Guilford, and today I'm joined by Roy Baumeister, the author of our new book, The Self-Explained, Why and How We Become Who We Are. Hi, Dr. Baumeister. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you a few questions about your new book. Um, in your book, you argue that nobody has a true self. And I was wondering if you could just briefly explain what you mean by this. Well, uh, that brings up a couple of complicated issues. Uh, the, the true self is sort of an ideal or something people have, and they often mean it to refer to something that's contrary to their actions. It's something hidden inside them that they have to, uh, uh, that they have to find and discover. Uh, it's often tied up in that research in authenticity. Authenticity is something that everybody wants, but nobody knows quite what it is. <laughs> uh, and so the true self is, is kind of the mythology of that. So uh, there, there are two issues here. The self is not the self-concept, although people mix those up. So first of all, a true self-concept, well, uh, you know, people have mistakes. Uh, most concepts of the self have some distortion. Uh, so uh, what would be absolutely the true uh, version of self? Most people have, have trouble getting at that. There's a lot of self-deception and distortion in there. Uh, in terms of a true self that's different from how you act, I mean, ultimately, the true self is, is what you do and how you relate to others and so on. But to believe in a different from that, well, that doesn't, that doesn't quite make any sense. The psychology certainly not discovered any kind of uh, thing that's buried inside that's different from the, the reality uh, of what you do. That's so interesting. Um, you say that there are different theories um, that people propose that each person has many selves or one self or no self at all. Um, and what's your take on this? How do you resolve that basic question? Yes, yes, yes. Well, that's a basic question. Do we have a self? Uh, some people think there's no such thing as a self, that it's an illusion. Uh, some people think, uh, well, everyone has multiple selves. Um, I, each of these has a, a valid insight that's, a, that's the basis on it. So we've got to learn from all, all these different theories. But the right answer is, is you have one self. The multiple selves are different versions of the same self. Uh, so I say, well, you're a different person when you're out drinking with your buddies versus when you're at home with your mother. Uh, well, uh, you're, you're really the same self. If somebody came to you and they borrowed money from you or you borrowed money from them, uh, you still owe it to them. Uh, regardless, you can't say, oh, no, that was my work self that borrowed <laughs> money from you. Uh, and so... Uh, it's really different versions of the same self. Now, the people who believe there's no self, I, I think that's kind of an interesting intellectual exercise. Uh, but uh, ultimately, I noticed they still put their names on their books. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was tempted to tell them, okay, well, next time you get on an airplane, don't take any identification along and just explain to them that selves are illusions uh, and see how far you get. You probably get as far as security. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, they'll, they'll take you away and then you'll pretty much discover that you do have a true self. Um, selves are really, they begin with positions in society. Uh, it's the social structure. We evolved to benefit from these sorts of social structures that we have. Uh, and it's a very effective system. Our human population continues to increase while most other populations of, of mammals at least are, are declining. So it's a good plan. The brain has to learn to operate roles in the social system. And that's how the self uh, comes into being. Uh, and the creation of unity across time, that's, that's the key to it. So the self is putting together the different parts into a whole. Uh, at the simple version, like babies or animals, uh, walking is a good example. You've got to control your arms and, uh, you know, if you've got four paws. I, I remember watching, I don't know, uh, walking or actually crawling is a good example. I remember watching my uh, baby girl learn to crawl and it's right hand, left knee, left hand, right knee. So the brain has to understand right and left, has to understand hands and knees, has to move them crosswise and alternate. That's imposing a system that moves the body as a whole. So there's the creation of unity. That's a very early version. And obviously most animals master that. Human cells are much more advanced uh, we extend across time, and that helps uh, society work better. I mean, I, again, to borrow money, you've got to pay it back. So you have to have the same self that acknowledges 
uh, the, the debt that you uh, made before. Um, and uh, the creation of unity remains imperfect. Uh, nobody's perfectly consistent or, or anything, but uh, it's sort of a goal. Again, the brain is learning to perform uh, this way because the social system uh, works better when, when people have continuous jobs and roles and uh, moral reputations and, and modern life bank accounts and property and uh, uh, job titles and college degrees and, and, and many other things. That's so interesting. I love the um, the analogy of the crawling and the left and right. That just totally puts it into focus. Um, one of the things that's so great about your book, The Self Explained, is um, how unique it is in its scope. Uh, you intended its audience to be um, like expert scientists who are doing cutting edge research on the self, and also um, just like your typical college student taking a class. Um, how and why do you think your book is useful to all these different facets of people? Well, lots of, lots of people are interested in the self, uh, for one thing. Uh, some people have a personal interest in understanding who they are uh, and uh, how they should function in society. And, and the, the interest in self-discovery motivates people to look at horoscopes and uh, have their fortune told and to uh, spend years in psychoanalysis uh, exploring their dreams and unconscious. Uh, so uh, there's a, a popular interest in, in self-knowledge. And then many disciplines uh, rely on the self too, especially the ones that are more interpersonal. Uh, for economics, for example, it doesn't make sense. You wouldn't have a marketplace if you couldn't own what you bought. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so the distribution of rewards and all that depends on cells and I did the postdoc in sociology, they're very interested in self and identity. Many other fields are too. So this is a, a topic that's, that's, that's broadly uh, interesting. And I think when you write for an, an audience that's outside your own narrow circle of experts, mm -hmm. you should write it at the level of a sort of upper level college student, because that's right. all we know about other fields. Uh, I may have a PhD uh, in psychology, but my knowledge of economics is no better than, uh, let's say, an undergraduate would be. So if somebody wants to communicate economics to me, they better couch it in terms that an undergraduate uh, could understand. Uh, so I, I tried to uh, write the book uh, in those terms to explain things uh, very clearly and basically and not assume a lot of expert knowledge. Um, but it's very strongly grounded in, in the research. Uh, so that uh, the experts would, would respect the ideas. I, mean, I, I started doing research on the self back in the 1970s, and dating myself, but, uh, when I was in, uh, in, in graduate school getting my education. And uh, many people were interested uh, in exploring the self back then. Um, and since then, I've worked in many different areas of the self. And so I kind of have a broad understanding of it. I'm thinking in 50 or 100 years, it'll be almost impossible to write a book like this because there'll be so much information. Really? By the time you mastered one thing, you'd be way behind uh, in something else. So I was hoping this was, it was still possible to do this, <laughs> trading on the fact that I've uh, worked in many different areas in the, in the broad self umbrella. You, you just referenced that you have been studying the self for so, for many years. Um, and over the course of your career, is there like one or two moments or highlights that stick out as particularly illuminating or incredible to you, a discovery, a moment of clarity? Well, it's hard to pick one or two. Uh, I'm, I'm, my approach is always to sort of follow the data. I mm -hmm. often have hunches when I start, but I assume most of my ideas are wrong. My goal is to end up knowing the truth. And I assume I have to revise my opinions to get there. So there's been a lot of changing of, of, uh, of my opinions. I got on to self-esteem early before it was a, a buzzword in society. Uh, one of my professors said, oh, there's this new thing called self-esteem. I, I actually did my undergraduate thesis on it. Um, and then that was taken off in the 70s and 80s. And I thought, wow, this is really a powerful, important thing. And then the data started turning rather disappointing on that, that... Uh, uh, it wasn't going to be the cure-all of all sorts of problems that, that we'd hoped. Um, so I, I became somewhat disillusioned with self-esteem. I mean, people still care about it, but it's more a result than a cause of things. Uh, 
uh, switching to self-control, I realized that is much more uh, of a cause. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you look at this particularly by measuring people over time. And so you say students with good grades have higher self-esteem and that tempted everyone to think, oh, if you could just raise everyone's self-esteem, then students will learn better and everyone will get good grades. Uh, but when you look track over time, it was the grades came first and then the self-esteem. So raising their self-esteem isn't going to lead to better grades. But with self-control, it does work out that self-control measured at time one leads to all sorts of good outcomes on time two. Um, then I tried to master the research on, on self-control. I read a lot of things and understanding that the, the folk idea of willpower actually has some, some benefits, some traction that it does seem like when there are a lot of demands on your self-control at the same time, you don't perform as well. It seems like you run out uh, of willpower. So your ability fluctuates there. That was another uh, big step. Um, for the book, I read a lot of the research on psychopathology and mental illness and, and how the self goes wrong there. Um, and I initially assumed, well, it must be that you have some wrong idea about yourself that's causing problems. Well, there's a little bit of that, but the much bigger theme that came up over and over again, it's how the self is put together. Again, that reinforced the idea that the self is a system, a bunch of, of moving parts, and if they're connected wrong, uh, then the person can't function that well. Oh, wow. uh, some people have all the good parts together and all the bad parts right. together. Uh, funny sort of thing. Well, that, uh, that doesn't work out so well. So it's really more about the organization uh, than the content. That is another uh, insight. And I hope there are at least half a dozen more scattered through the book that, uh, that the readers will enjoy discovering also. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Our, my last question is more of a fun one. Um, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you as a person uh, on a personal level. So when you're not working, what do you do for fun? And is there a project that you're really excited to work on next? Well, um, I do like to have a little fun every day, um, but um, I do work a lot. It's probably the work has been really uh, interesting and uh, I like thinking about big ideas and learning new things. And so uh, sometimes I'll have a glass of champagne or, or something, but I often then turn on the computer anyway to, uh, uh, to go over thoughts. Uh, I, uh, for many years, I enjoyed uh, playing uh, guitar. I'm getting a little old, and what happens when you get old is you're, you get arthritis and you can't do it anymore. My, my hero, the great guitarist, John McLaughlin, he finally gave up playing the guitar uh, because uh, fingers just uh, become too painful and don't work as well. So that happened to me a bit, but the, the guitar playing was, was lovely for a long time. Um, I used to windsurf also. That's kind of gone out of fashion. That was also a, a very, I can still ski. I had a lovely time skiing uh, this past winter. Um, what I've really enjoyed, and I, I'm not much of a tourist. A lot of people say they want to travel and things. What I like is living in different places. So Right now, I have two months here in this uh, lovely little medieval town in, in northern Germany. Um, and again, I'm not a tourist. I'm not like going to visit the church and take pictures of things and all that. I'm not interested in that. But I like living here and having my little German habits and shopping at the same places and eating German food and, um, and sit outside and uh, um, in a cafe and enjoy the afternoon sun, this kind of thing that uh, we're living currently in the US, or I live recently in Australia, that wasn't really so easy and possible to do. Um, so I like being in different places and having sort of a different uh, uh, version of, uh, of my life. And I think particularly for a social scientist, living in different culture is really stimulating. Partly just seeing your own home culture from a distance uh, is fascinating. I'm an American and living in America, well, you caught up in everything American and so on. And just seeing America from a dis distance right. is already interesting. And again, the tourist doesn't necessarily get that, but you live here for a while and you talk and you sort of hear the American news at the background at a great distance. Um, it gives you a different perspective. And then many things that you take for granted are just, uh, are just different uh, in a different culture. And uh, the people have different ways of looking, thing, looking at things. And, uh, so all that kind of stuff is fascinating to me. I agree. Yeah, I think living in living in a different place really um, 
changes you and changes your perspective and makes you feel more a part of the culture that you're visiting for like an extended period of time. Really. Yes. It also makes you feel part of your own culture too, because you appreciate it. It stands out to you more. I mean, being an American in Europe really makes you aware of being an American. Yeah. <laughs> more than being an American uh, in Cleveland. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, thank you so much and congratulations on um, your new book, The Self-Explained. It's really, it's really an outstanding work. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, um, I hope the readers like it too. Okay, great. Thanks again. Okay.